Right, it's good to see everyone. Anybody pregnant? There's no pregnancy notes up here this evening. Good shape here. All right. You know, we need to open our eyes and open our mouths. We need to open up our Bibles. And I'll tell you what, folks, great things will happen to this body of Christ as well as you individually. We need to spread the gospel in this community. You know, a preacher related a story to me that something that happened to his life uh, when he was a junior in college and he remembered it very vividly as he was expressing it. It happened at a Perkins uh, Pancake restaurant and he was sitting across from the man that had made him very, very mad, very angry. And he just wasn't angry uh, with this man. He flat out hated this man. And he wanted just more than just to, to talk with the man. But this man had done nothing but cause him and his family trouble. This man had done nothing but cause him and his family uh, stress. He caused his family to spend time in a uh, women's shelter. Uh, they lived in cheap apartments. And they barely got by uh, making ends meet about all of his life. He committed adultery several times, numerous times, uh, against his mother. Uh, he had physically abused his mother. He remembered on one occasion when he was about 11 or 12, he, he remembered coming in and uh, he had his mother pinned down on the couch and was uh, getting ready to just physically totally abuse her. He was only 11 or 12. He didn't know what to do, so he went into the kitchen, got a knife, <clears throat> and he ran, ran back into the living room and started screaming. And... Uh, the, the people who lived upstairs called the police, luckily, and, and uh, that's, that's how that went down. And after that, he spent about eight or nine months in jail. And he wanted to do something that would physically hurt him, but he knew that, you know, if he did that, that he, would, he himself would probably end up in jail. But there are other ways uh, that he could hurt this man, and this man came seeking forgiveness for him, from him, at that occasion that... Perkins Pancake House a few years later. And he did not hurt him physically, although he wanted to. The man sought forgiveness, and he did not give it to him. And words were exchanged, pretty heated words. And the man, of course, by now you figured out it was his father. And uh, they left. A few years later, uh, he was preaching a sermon at the Church of Christ in, I think it was Illinois or Indiana. But he was preaching a sermon, and he mentioned something about forgiveness. And what happened was... When he mentioned forgiveness and the point he was making in the sermon, actually the word of God touched him and, and he realized, you know, he's talking about himself, there were some things that he needed to do uh, in relationship with his father. So, after he got done preaching the lesson, he called his father and apologized to his father and said, uh, and gave him the forgiveness that his father was seeking. Difficult thing to do. Very difficult. I think forgiveness is found throughout the Word of God. It is a theme, I think, in the Scripture. And, of course, that's what the Lord is all about. And if it wasn't forgiveness, we wouldn't stand a chance. We wouldn't be here. It's about forgiveness, I think. But forgiveness is more than just a teaching in the Word of God. I think for all of us, as we grow and develop and mature in Christ, that that's a characteristic that we have. That is something that we grow into. I, I don't know if anybody that's come up out of the water and just has this spirit of, of forgiveness. I think it's something that needs to be taught. I think it's something that needs to be learned uh, because it's not a natural thing. It's not a natural reaction that, that we automatically do. Jesus uses the word 70 times 7. And I want to look here at this language this evening and, and just look at some ideas about what Jesus uh, reminds us when it comes to forgiveness. In Matthew 18, I want you to notice verse 21 and, and, and notice what uh, Denny's read for us. Uh, the language there that's, that's used, as you look at that, there's actually a question that the apostle Peter makes. And he asks that in verse 21. So Peter raises the question, how many times should I forgive somebody? I mean, I mean, is there, there must be a limit. How many times should I forget? And looking at this, you ever try to figure out why Peter came up with the number that he came up with? Seven? Is seven times enough, you know? And, and I think the conversation about forgiveness, I think actually the Lord brought it up, and they've been talking about it, Verse 15 says, if your brother sins and goes and shows you his fault, in private, if he listens to you, you've won a brother. They've been talking about forgiveness. So Peter, I think, initially raises the question because it was taught earlier 
they're on the scene, they're talking about forgiveness. But I was trying to figure out how he came up with that number, seven, seven times. That, that ought to do it. And we talk about Peter and talk about him putting his foot in his mouth a lot and doing different things. But I think, and I, I'm not, I don't have any proof of this, but I, I've got an idea, and my answer's not conclusive, so I don't, don't hold me to this. But I think during the time that the Lord walked on the earth, uh, that the Jews had accepted that three times, three, you could count them, one, two, three, you could figure out three times, that, that was pretty well the limit. I could forgive you three times if you uh, sinned against me, three was it. So when Peter steps up to the plate and he says what he says to the Lord, and it's just not a number off the top of the hat, he's basing it on the three deal, I think. He multiplies it by two, and of course seven's a perfect number, and that ought to, that ought to impress the Lord. So seven times, that's actually twice what they were, I think, thinking, and plus one more. So when he says seven, you know, I, and I think about that, but in that even, Peter recognizes that there's a need for forgiveness, and not only is there a need to forgive, but also there's still a limit when we forgive someone. But the answer Jesus gives him is not what he's talk, or thinking about or expects in verse 22. So he raises the bar. No, you don't forgive them seven times, but seven times 70. No, not 490 times. We're not going to count 490 times out. 491 is the magic number, but, but there's no capping the limit of forgiveness is Jesus' point. Jesus is emphasizing to Peter that you should forgive, and, and to those that are, that are listening, you need to recognize that, that there's no end to forgiveness, that we need to have this characteristic about us as brethren. Now, the scripture reading the idea of 10,000 talents, and there's just a gazillion different numbers and a zillion different ways that you can measure that, but one number is that one talent would equal 15 years of wages, 15 years. Now imagine that. So as you think about 10,000 talents and each talent representing 15 years of wages, there's no way that, that the guy could pay that back. There's just no way. The, the end would be limit. I mean, and you think, I can't do it. But the slave approaches the king with the spirit and the attitude that he's going to pay him back, that I'm going to do this. You just give me some time, have mercy on me. I'm going to work it out where I'm going to pay you back, all right? But the king extends something to the slave that he didn't see coming, no? No, and he didn't ask for it. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to erase the debt that you owe, and, and everything's forgiven, and you don't have to repay me. It's all good. So I noticed that, and, and again, Verse 27, he says, I, I, I'm just going to erase the debt. I'm going to wipe it clean. That's what he says. So he forgave him his debt. Now, what a great story that is. And it would be a great story if it ended there. We talked about this text a couple months ago, but I want to look at it again. Verse 28, didn't end there, but the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owned him a hundred denarii, and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. Imagine the debt that this man was forgiven. And you see the contrast there? And really, one denarii is like one day's wages. So what should this man have done and responded to the guy that owed him? Don't worry about it. And felt bad about even offering that. But he didn't do that. All right? Read on. So his fellow slave fell to the ground, began to plead with him, having, uh, saying, Have patience with me, I'll repay you. But he was unwilling and went back and threw him in prison that he should pay back what he owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported it to the Lord who, had, who that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have also had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed to him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. The application of the parable I think is very easy. You can understand the parable, but doing the parable, actually applying the parable to our life, I think that might be difficult for us to do. And I look at that, and, and I think the, the parable is very humbling. I think it's very thought-provoking. Uh, I think it's very scary, really, sometimes. Here's the king. The king represents who? God, our heavenly father. That's the king in this parable. And Jesus is demonstrating to Peter and the rest of the disciples here that as, as God has taken away a tremendous debt in our life, the tremendous debt of sin, the tremendous debt that we owe God. We owe that to God. God has done the same for you as he did in the parable. We need to see that. We need to recognize that. So 
If we see that, recognize that, what's our response? We should extend the same mercy, the same spirit, the same forgiving heart to our brethren, to our brothers and sisters, and all of those. And how do we do that? Well, we remember. We remember the great love that God had for us and what he has forgiven us. Now, I want you to notice Ephesians 1. I think Paul uses this pattern that he's laid out as he's, as he's teaching those at, at Ephesus and, and really the story that, that Jesus spoke here again, the pattern, but he's going to talk about forgiveness and, and he kind of uh, sums it up in chapter 4. But what he does in the beginning of, cha of, of the book in chapter 1 is that he relates to how much Jesus Christ has done. How much he's done, what he is, who he is, and how much he's done for you. And of course, Ephesians 1, let's look at verse 7. In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to his riches and grace. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. We cannot be saved outside of Christ. We're baptized into Christ where all spiritual blessings are. If all of them's in him, there's none of them outside of him. And we're there, and when we're in that relationship with Christ, we have the forgiveness of our sins. If you don't have that relationship with Christ, you don't have any forgiveness. But we do. How many sins? All of our sins. The debt was paid. We could not pay it. And now that we're in Christ, we have the forgiveness of sins. Look at verse 19. And he says, And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? The power of Christ, the power of God, through our faith and obedience to him, we can have forgiveness of our sins. What a powerful Savior we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a loving, tender-hearted, forgiving God that I'm in a relationship with. Now, he reminds them of what Jesus has done for you. Now he's going to remind them of what you were or the condition that you were in. Look at chapter 2, verse 2 or verse 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. That was the condition you were in. You were a dead man. He says, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, he says, according to the prince of power of the air, of the spirit that now is working in the sons of disobedience. Look how we walk. Look what kind of people that we were. Look what Jesus and God did, chapter 1. Look what we were. Look how we were. And now he's reminding them of the awesome blessing, of the awesome gift that God has given us. What is that? Forgiveness of our sins. Eternal life. Now, in chapter 3 of Ephesians, he's going to pray for them. He's going to pray that they recognize this, that they learn about God and fully recognize just what's been done. Look at chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. What reason? From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, here it is, you might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know, know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. This was the prayer that Paul had for the saints at Ephesus. That they would be able to comprehend that love, that amount of forgiveness that God has given them. So, that's why I can say in chapter 4, look at verse 32. Chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, doing what? forgiving each other, just as Christ also has forgiven you. You know what? When you understand some things, when you have the proper relationship with God and Christ, and when you realize the condition that you were in, and you realize the debt that was forgiven you, listen, I'm not going to have any problem forgiving anyone in this room about anything. I'm not worthy. I'm not. And I know I'm not worthy. And I'm thankful for the debt that was paid for me. And in that, in that, I pray that I understand that. And I pray that I do the same for my fellow man as well as my brethren. Well, he did the same thing in the book of Colossians. Turn with me to chapter 2. He's going to remind them about the great debt of sin that they had. He would remind them that they need to extend the same mercy. Again, look at verse 12. Here's what happened. 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, when you were what? Dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He made you alive with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions. Dead in our sins, made us alive in Christ. How's that? We were buried with him in baptism and doing that, that act of obedience, the final act of obedience, he has forgiven us of all of our transgressions. Jesus and Paul made it very clear. I believe that we should forgive one another. And they remind us, of course, the Lord reminded his disciples, Paul reminded the, the, the saints about, about, about the love of God and how he's extended that love to us. What a motivating factor that is for all of us to think about that. Going back to the text, Matthew 18, let's look at verse 35 again. I think it's critical that we understand what this teaches us. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you. He says, if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. He teaches us something about forgiveness. He's showing that forgiveness is more than just lip service. Forgiveness is more than just some facade. And, and you know what? There has to be a thorough change of attitude. There has to be a thorough change of spirit. In other words, that has to go in. Forgiveness has to be an attitude. It can't be lip service, and it has to come from the heart. Now, this doesn't mean that we overlook sin. This doesn't mean that we don't uh, recognize that there's consequence of sin that has to be paid. We're not looking overlooking the repentance. We're not looking overlooking the consequence. But Jesus says if we don't forgive, Jesus says we're going to find ourselves in a lot of trouble. Forgiveness is a characteristic of the Christian. Seven times 70. Jesus wants us to forgive one another. I tell you, that's easy words to say. It is. It's easy to say that up here behind the big piece of wood. But I tell you what, it's hard to do. It's hard to make that application. But that's what we've been called to do. That's part of it. That's part of us being Christians. I quote a poet, Alexander Pope, the poet. He said to err is human, to forgive is divine. And that's true. And the reason that is is because a lot of folks just don't get it. And they refuse to forgive because it's Hard to do. Forgiveness is definitely divine sometimes in our lives. It's possible. It's possible if we have the right type of heart. We have the right type of spirit in our lives. You know, I always think about my life. You know, I, I've, met, I've really messed up. I, I fumbled the ball a lot. I've done it. I've displayed not the spirit of Christ in a lot of situations when I should have. I, I've done that. But, but I, I look at what Paul told the saints in Ephesus, what he wrote about the Colossians. And you know what? Sometimes we can mess up. Sometimes we don't have the right attitude dealing with the things that we need to deal with in our life. But I'll tell you what, I can always repent and I can always look at this book and see the example that Jesus Christ set for me in his life. And I'm supposed to pattern my life after my Lord and Savior. I get to do that because I have a relationship with him. Jesus always did the right thing, brethren. And we need to strive to do that. Luke chapter 23. Luke's account of the crucifixion. Here it is, verse 34. Jesus, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Talk about a place that he was in. I want you to think about that. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. The trial, the scourging, the mockery, the humiliation. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing, was said after all of that. Drag the cross, crumble under the cross, nail to the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Casting lots, the spear, the crown of thorns. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Now you imagine that spirit of forgiveness. Imagine that. And I have trouble... Sometimes, look at the Lord's example about forgiveness. It's amazing. You know, the cross, I think, can help us deal and help us acquire a spirit of forgiveness like no other. There's a lot of things you can see at the cross. You know, while I look at the cross, one of the things, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing, is that the Lord didn't seek revenge. And if anybody could have had revenge, at the, at the blinking of an eye, it was Jesus Christ. No revenge. 
Our Lord could have called 10,000 angels. No, sir. No. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. A lot of us will forgive after revenge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's even now. We're even. I'm one up. That's, that's how we think a lot sometimes. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And in that, there was no hate in the individuals that were doing what he was doing. A lot of times when somebody sins against you, the hate guy comes out. And it's awful. And it's a hard time getting past that hate. I believe if anybody was justified to hate, it'd be the guy that's getting nailed to the cross. I believe those fellows wouldn't be on the top of my list. No. Wasn't there for the Lord. Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Well, and I look at the cross and I think that Jesus took, I guess, the incentive, I think, in that. You know, he was praying for them while he was beating them. And, and while they, that he was suffering, while they were nailing them to the cross, Jesus is teaching us, I think, something very important about our disposition and making our relationships right with each other. And that is that, and again, that's found in Matthew 18, verse 15, that, that your brother says you need to go to him. You need to take that initiative. You need to take that because you know what? You have a spirit about you that not only you want to forgive somebody, but you want to go out of your way and you want to extend yourself. You want to be the one running and saying, look, let's take care of this. Oftentimes when somebody owes us one, we're back in the corner humped up waiting for it to come. A lot of times. And, and of course, a lot of things brew and it just keeps getting worse and worse. So the Lord took that incentive. But not only that, but he allowed... In Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. He allowed for reconciliation. A lot of times when we are in that position, a lot of times stiff neck happens. We're not going to forgive. We're not going to do it. No matter what happens, no matter how humble, no matter how proper the spirit is, it's just not going to flow. When did Jesus allow that forgiveness to the people that were nailing him to the cross? When did Jesus allow that forgiveness to those that were in control of his execution? When did the Lord allow that to happen? Well, it happened on the day of Pentecost. Those that had a direct hand in Jesus dying on the cross had the opportunity for forgiveness on the day of Pentecost when Peter made it plain and clear that those that nailed him to the cross, you are the ones that are responsible. You did this to the Son of Man. What must we do to be saved? You're not going to do anything to be saved. Go to the house. You're all condemned to hell. That's what you deserve. No, sir. The Lord allowed reconciliation. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And that's the day the Lord's church began. We know the story. But Jesus allowed forgiveness, but in that forgiveness, he allowed the reconciliation to happen. You know, in fact, look at Luke 17. Almost the same kind of language in our text in 18. But I want to look at verse, let's see, Luke 17, verse 3. Notice what he says. Luke 17, verse 3. Be on your guard, he says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, well, he says, forgive him. Well, forgive him if he repents. He's trying to set things right, so forgive him. Verse 4. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you need to forgive him. You know, the language that Jesus uses here is very clear. And it's the idea of reconciliation. And it's the idea of the spirit that we ought to have when it comes to the subject of forgiveness. I'll tell you, you know, that this is hard to do at times. And maybe I'm the only one that's been saying, I am the only one that's been saying anything for the last half hour. But maybe I'm the only one in the room that's ever uh, thought that this is hard to do. I think it's challenging sometimes. And because of the challenge, I think sometimes that it doesn't get done. And things are left undone. And I get a kick out of the, the text here in Luke 17. After Jesus tells them to be on the guard, forgive them, and all of those things, and for seven times. And verse 5, the apostles say what? Increase our faith. We're going to need some help in this. We're going to need some help in this, what you're saying. Uh, it's almost like, are you serious? This, this many times, this is how you want it? Yes. Yeah, if you're going to serve me, Yes. This is how you have to think about forgiveness. Yes, this is it. Jesus cried out on the cross. You know what? We need to cry out to God in prayer that we have the type of heart that the Lord requires us as Christians, as his followers, in forgiveness for each other. We really do. We do that. Matthew 6, the final text. Sermon on the Mount, verse 14. We need not to fail to give our brother and sister whoever needs our forgiveness. We cannot fail not to do that. 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. He says this, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your heavenly Father will not forgive you your transgressions. It doesn't get any plainer than that. Sermon on the Mount. Forgiveness is tough sometimes. It requires a heart like Jesus. The Lord did it. The brethren in the first century did it. And brethren, we need to forgive. We can do it. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's the gospel. If you've not done that, you do not have the proper relationship with Jesus Christ. You cannot obtain the forgiveness of your sins. I don't care how hard you pray. I don't care what a beautiful prayer you make. You will not be saved until you obey the gospel of Christ. Please come. As together we stand and sing.